Uh, all right. Well, I think we're live. So I'm assuming we're live. It says we're live. We're live. It says so we're, we're live. Uh, hi, world. I'm Jason Seiden. This is The Brilliance Within. This is um, my opportunity to talk to people who I think are amazing and doing amazing things and, and learn from them and do it in a public way where you can be a fly on the wall and learn along with me. Uh, or just marvel at what a nerd I am, um, which is also fun. Nobody Brilliant was available, he, uh, he got me today. Oh, oh no, oh no, <laughs> oh, no Sean, I have, I have questions for you. I know what you're capable of. <laughs> now let's add, let's add humility to the list, <laughs> self-deprecating humor to the list. Uh, Sean Shepard, thank you so much for joining today. You've got a company called U Plus. You are, when it comes to innovation, I think about you. Uh, do you want to take a second and just share what you do and what the company is about, your background, just a little bit of, of something to anchor the conversation, and then, and then I'm coming for you. I have questions yeah. for you. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, so 30 years as a serial tech entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, um, five startups, uh, three exits, and two very expensive and valuable learning experiences along the way. Uh, I did three venture funds. I built the world's first product market fit. A startup accelerator and a school to train people to work in Silicon Valley startups. Um, and then I wasn't going to do any more funds. Uh, I, I uh, got involved in helping my portfolio start working with large enterprises on various POCs and pilots to try and integrate their technology into, into, into some new products that we're building. And through the course of that, I sort of got dragged into corporate innovation by accident. Um, I was helping the startup with a large organization. They saw how I worked and, and how successful we were in executing against um, uh, the pilot and asked me if I could help them launch some new digital products because they were not a digital company. It was outside their core. Um, I agreed to help them and apply everything I've learned from the startup world to, to corporates. Um, we had a lot of success in commercializing the new ideas, but we had challenges in building them. Um, because internal IT teams are not really designed to, to build new products that are there to support existing businesses. And, and um, I ran across Uplus, which was a 15-year-old corporate venture builder that started in Europe. They just come to the U.S. and they were officing in my building in San Francisco. I built a relationship and I essentially hired them to help me execute on these projects and build these new businesses for this large organization. Um, we had a lot of success. Um, Essentially, you know, we dated for a while and had someone else pay for it, as I like to say. Right. And then, uh, that turned into an opportunity to uh, take a significant stake in the company, which I did. And I decided that this was the next thing I wanted to do. Um, and so we've built over 15 years, about 130 new ventures for large organizations around the world. We're in 14 countries, 25 nationalities. Um, and more recently, we've launched an AI platform to automate a lot of the front end of the innovation function called Fifth Row. Uh, where we can now do an hour is what used to take months uh, by um, discovering, researching, ideating, uh, testing, and validating new business models in a matter of weeks with pennies on the dollar um, versus what it used to be as a professional service. And then we take those forward um, to, uh, you know, to build and commercialize the ones that show real market demand that meet the core assets mm -hmm. and strategies and capabilities of an organization. And then, Based on all of that and the success we've had with that, we've decided to launch our own AI powered uh, startup studio. So uh, very soon here, we're going to be uh, building a series of services of software AI products, which we think is the future. Um, using services our- Services of software, not software as a service, services no. of software. Yeah. Right, so so we, the, quick pause. You sure. used one acronym that I wanna make sure everybody knows, POC. Yeah, proof of concept. And, um, and you've actually touched on a bunch of stuff that I want to come back and, and ask you about. But I, before you before you finish about the AI, I just want to make a comment. You know, I've seen what you were talking about. You you and I actually talked about it a few months ago. And I'm not even sure it had a name when we talked about it. But one of the things that struck me, that impressed me at the time, and you're showing it now, is you were so sing Freud about it. You know, here is a tool that on the face of it cannibalizes your your business or a significant chunk of your revenue. Mm -hmm. And perhaps because you have an entrepreneurial background, you see these things, you know that one opportunity leads to another. You just were very calm about, look, this is what it is. This is happening. It's either going to happen to us or we're going to do it. So we're going to do it. And here you are a few months later and already you're making the shift and you've already identified the next opportunity. Let's create our own AI 
incubator. It's it's just the fearlessness. Um, sorry, you you might be completely terrified about this. The willingness to go with that flow and step into it, whether or not you're afraid of it, struck me the last time I spoke to you, and it strikes me now. And I just want to call that out. Well, I appreciate that. I think I'm just too ignorant to be terrified. Um, but That's good. Also, that helps. I think a couple of things, right? Number one, I think this the way I laid it out that speaks to the to the rate of change that we live in now. Yeah, it was say 20 years ago. I like to use that old statistic that the turnover rate on the S and P 500 in the year, you know, uh, 1970 was uh, 75 years. In other words, it would take 75 years to replace a member of the S and P 500. I think today, I think in 2000, it's it um, it's it it dropped to 50 percent. And I think today, we're looking at at turning over. Um, maybe a third every five years. So um, it's like 75 months. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, and I think Bezos said this great many years ago when he was sort of stepping away from CEO world and uh, at Amazon, he's like, you know, our, our competition doesn't exist yet. We don't know who they are, but they're coming. Um, right. And we don't even know who these people are. Um, and, and AI is doing, I think what, um, I, I think this level of transformational change hasn't happened since uh, going from, uh, on-prem to cloud, um, and before that, uh, you know, from from BBS to the internet, um, mm -hmm. and and I think um, that you're going to see eighty percent of of professional services go away, um, and I think that what you're going to have is um, you're going to have professional services that are powered by AI in a way that allows the those that survive this transformation to right. be focused on the really big creative and critical thought challenges at the strategic level um and 80 percent of the work is going to get done by by the ai um and so you know i've always been somebody who, who looks for change loves change embraces change because i've got add um so these things don't bother me the way they do a lot of people um, but yeah, that uh, service as a software, uh, service as a software, I believe is the evolution of managed services uh, in that you will need smart, trusted, experienced, knowledgeable people like you and I, dare I say, uh, that know how to use these tools to get the most out of human performance and advance things faster and cheaper than they were ever able to before. Mm -hmm. So you will still need that human and series of humans in the loop as you're using tools like AI. And I, I believe right now today, the most um, the most practical application of AI is as an assistant or as Microsoft brands it, a co-pilot, not yeah. a full agent. Everybody's worried about a future that doesn't exist yet. Oh, it's going to take Listen, a I, it's going to make these decisions for me. No, Descript, Descript, Descript just had, had a. It, uh, there's a better name. Descript just had a product launch announcement yesterday. They've upgraded their their video editing software. They call their AI companion their the Underlord. It's not your <laughs> Overlord. It's your Underlord. And that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But you are replacing very expensive, um, yeah. often uh, difficult to manage humans uh, with tools to a well, certain degree. So, so I, I have, I've got a number of questions for you, but there, there's one that I have that hooks into what you're saying. And I just want to, I want to throw it out. Uh, this is a, this is a strategic issue masked as something tactical. Uh, back in the day, you'd get hired, you know, you go to school, you get hired for a job. Your job was to do the job and you became an expert in the tools. And then when you became a manager, you still needed to work your way around the tools, right? You had, you know, every once in a while you'd have to show a kid something, but your job was really now to play nice in the sandbox, get resources from the team, right? Just get approvals, keep things aligned, administer projects. And then eventually you'd get an executive job and, and that became more political and organizational. And it's like, can we get to yes, given the fact that it's a zero sum game at this level, right? Just a different ball game. And one of the things that I've noticed that SAS has done over the last 10, 15 years is it has made all of us have to 
simultaneously be proficient with the tools and proficient as managers and proficient at the organizational level, right? And for a lot of people that, you know, I know they're not executives, but the solopreneurs, you have to sell, which is really the same skill as, as organizationally getting to yes in a zero sum game. And I've watched it kind of crush organizational efficiency because, you know, you, it's not equal, right? The tools evolve and, and I'm 50. I'm like, I don't have brain space to learn an, uh, an 18th text editor, right? Like, just let me use what I'm good at. So I, as, as you look at the future and, uh, you know, AI's ability to be a companion, do you see it solving some of those problems where we've kind of gotten ourselves stuck? Like, I have to hire this really senior expensive person but a lot of what I'm using the person for is to actually do junior level work because this is just the, the way the world is. So now I get to hire this person to do the big stuff and have AI basically know how to navigate the system. Am I making any sense at all? This is no, such a big question. No, I think you're making, you're, you're making, you're making total sense. So, so a couple of things, right? I mean, what is the promise of technology ultimately and why did I decide this is a career path? Because I believe in the, its ability to, be highly leveraged to advance human performance. Uh, but then there is a law of diminishing returns if you get to a point of over-reliance on those tools, which I think is sort of the cause of the effect that you just laid out, you know. Um, I'm saying what I did, um, so yeah. It becomes a crutch. Um, and it becomes a crutch. We atrophy the, the, the non, uh, you know, the hard, the soft skills get atrophied, right? In the age mm -hmm. of AI, nothing's more important than EI in my view emotional intelligence um, as a skill that we should all be developing. Uh, so, th so there's that component to it. Um, why people will still always hire consultants and use them and how they use them is less about how they're using them and more about their need for certainty and trust uh, and an experience, especially at the executive level that they're used to, right? Nobody gets fired mm -hmm. from hiring IBM. McKinsey's always going to have a role. BCG's always going to have a role. Deloitte's always going to have a role. Their role should change. You know, it should change into what we just talked about, higher value um, contributions as opposed to, say, the tactical stuff. Right. Uh, those that know how to embrace the change and know how to use the tools, because a fool with a tool is still a fool, um, uh, are recognized and, and, and will understand that, right? That's why we got the big four and all these consulting firms coming at us left and right, wanting to white label fifth row um, because they know they can replace, BCG knows they can replace the the, yeah. the offshoring of humans with something like this and get them 80% of the way there, 90% cheaper, which is the future. And it's already here. Now, is it evenly distributed? Absolutely not. It no, comes and, and it comes back to it, your point earlier about whether you're fearless and whether or not you want to embrace the change and whether or not you understand how to use these things. Yeah. Well, and I mean, listen, I think back to high school and I think it's not to me that adults act like they're in high school. I just think high school is it's practice for adulthood. So you, know, you think of English class, how many kids read the book, how many kids read the book and use spark notes to help how many people just read spark notes. And, um, and I, I think there's a, a general awareness or expectation that AI will follow the same curve. There will be plenty of people. Yeah, it's 80% of the way there. And that's fine. And, yeah. you know, right. And then there'll, there'll be, there'll be some that do exactly what you're talking about. And there's, um, there's a real risk that in that model, the, the, um, the crutch and the atrophy uh, cycle will be more significant than perhaps it's been in the past. And it's At already proven point. itself out. Yeah, it's already proven itself yeah. out. I mean, AI has already been proven to, uh, through a lot of research and study, uh, 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 increased human productivity anywhere between this range of 15 and 40% on average. And and the, 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 the variable that changes you from 15 to 40 usually has to do with how productive you are as a person to begin with. Um, <laughs> The high pose and the best employees are getting a 15% bump. The worst employees are getting a 40% bump. And it's exposing people in that way. 
Um, so it's yeah. so it's really interesting. I think what's most fascinating about AI is the closest revolution I've seen to this is the industrial revolution, where we replaced human power with mechanical power. Uh, AI is going to replace uh, you know uh, brain power with compute power. Um, do you think do you think AI will do to SaaS what the internet did to publishing? In what way? I'm thinking of your well, I'm thinking of your service as a software model, right? Yeah. So. Uh, the internet destroyed publishing, basically democratized it to the point of, of making it impossible, right? Between the democratization and the noise, it became impossible to uh, extract value from journalism. I'll just pick on journalism as a slice of public for a long period of time. And even now, you, you know, you try to read an article on Forbes. I mean, good luck with all the ads, you know, finding the, the seven words on the page. Right. Um, and, you know, it's come back a little bit, but it's, it's. I, I think about what you're talking about and the level of change and the, you know, the, the challenge that I was, the diminishing returns with SAS. And I could see a potential future where uh, you don't, you don't really need the SAS. The AI builds the software capability into the system. And so, you know, I'm going to ask, a question, right. You know, yep. so, you know, it, so you can create AI that wraps itself around maybe two or three apps uses them, you know, through an API in the back end. To me, I don't, I don't ever have to log in. I just ask my AI bot a question and it gives me data and an interpretation and, you know, and that's already, of that's already happening. I mean, I, 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 I kind of liken it to the paperclip, the Microsoft paperclip in the, in the late nineties, early two thousands, you know, it was one of those things that <laughs> it, it didn't, it, it never realized its true potential, but I always think yeah. that 30 years ago is, Man, wouldn't it be right. great if I could just talk to this paperclip and and learn, you know, clip me. my questions? Because to me, you know, the interface that you're talking about, the experience that humans are going to have, whether they're using ChatGPT or they're using Gemini or they're using Copilot or whatever, it's just an advancement of of, of Boolean search. Um, yeah, right. To use, a, to use a, a recruiting and talent and sourcing technology, it's how well are how it. Can you teach yourself how to interact with this thing in a way that gets you what you want? And the answer is yes. You can't break it. Uh, it's just a piece of software. Um, it's using large language models. It's only as good as the data, but you still have to have the ability to critically think your way through it, validate it, trust, but verify it, uh, and then extract the insights you're looking for. Um, that obviously has taken a lot of brain power from a lot of expensive and smart people for a long time. Um, a lot of that is being replaced and has already been replaced in many use cases using AI. So, so let me, so let me, let me step away from AI just for a second. I want to talk about innovation, right? Because the underpinning this, there's, so the, one of the undercurrents that I pick up from this is in order to embrace AI, you have to be good at innovation. Like a lot of the stuff that, you know, maybe gave you a small advantage yesterday, it's going to give you a huge advantage today. So you know, I'm, I'm a skier. This, we just went from a, a green to a black run. Same turns, same skills, but it's much steeper. So the margin for error is much smaller. You have to be much tighter on this. And when I think about innovation, like what it takes to bring any new product to market, whether you're an entrepreneur or especially if you're corporate, it's, it's not something that to me feels like it has a high success rate. And one of the things that I'm interested in talking about is you know number one why is it hard is it that innovation is just like hitting a baseball and no matter how good you are it just has a naturally high failure rate or is it that it's commonly misunderstood so you know people are approaching it wrong or is it just tough to execute and and then i'd i'd love to get your take on that and then wherever you take us i'd like to click into it and figure out like are there patterns to where those breaks are or to how companies can start thinking about innovation differently so they they can move a little faster. Yeah, well, it's pretty simple and I've experienced it myself over the last four years with U plus. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the mindset, skill set, and experience of the core business. Most of the innovative people and entrepreneurial people that started these companies are dead or retired. And so what do they do? They replace themselves with people who aren't going to screw up what they built. <laughs> and yeah, finished. sure. 
They're fantastic. Prioritizing continuity. They're fantastic at managing and optimizing what they already know and what is already known versus creating the new, um, whether it's a new product to an existing market, a new market, uh, a new product to a new market. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, the dynamic of taking something someplace new is very different. And the, the, the DNA of the individuals that are very good at that, in my experience, after doing this for 30 years, is very different than those that are great at managing the, the, the now as opposed to managing the new. So that would imply certain things. And one of the first questions I have, you know, one of the first follow-ups I have here is that to me would imply, um, you know, what, what Kelly Johnson said out of Skunk Works, right? That, that, that innovation needs to be protected. It needs to be put on an island with a moat around it so that all of the managers don't squash it. Correct. Uh, is that been your experience? Like, have yeah, you seen you need, you need, I mean, uh, where I've seen it be most successful is literally a separate entity with a separate P&L yeah. um, and a separate team of people who are yeah. given a safe space uh, to move quickly, uh, efficiently, cheaply, and quietly. Um, one of the things I coach our, or our clients on is to stop talking about it until you actually have real traction. Because the minute you start raising this, um, people, for whatever reason, and, and there's a distribution of 20% of the people support you actively, 20% of the people um, um, uh, uh, work against you actively, and the other 60% in the middle are easily swayed in one direction or another based on your results. I have seen a couple things. I, I hear all of that. I feel that. I've been in some large organizations that have violated that principle and run into um, run into well, a couple problems. The, the resistance, I think everybody's seen how things can die from resistance. But I've, I've also seen two examples of things dying under good intentions. Um, one, uh, I was with an organization, something new had started and it got, you know, like main stage, you know, traction in front of the, the company events. And all of a sudden, every department had its own version of the idea. and. You know, every the talk track was all right. We're going to support this. We're going to support that. But the reality was, this is my budget, and I'm going to redefine this idea to make my department look good. And I called it dandelioning because all of a sudden you had all of right instead of like one tree growing in the field, you had all of these little dandelions. Every department had its own version of this idea. They were all too successful at the department level to get killed, but none of them was successful enough at the organizational level to make a difference. And so you're stuck with this field of dandelions and you can't kill them. Yep. Um, the, uh, the other problem that I have run into in larger organizations is CROs who don't understand the power of, uh, or don't want to deal with the organizational complexity of having the standalone entity or department. Uh, and it's like, hey, we're just going to put all the salespeople together. And as soon as you do that, usually your new product is cheaper, has a lower success rate. There's something about it that the sales team's not. Well, I have never sell. seen an existing sales force uh, uh, that wasn't a part of developing a new product be successful with that new product. What, what usually happens, what, what needs to happen is this is where the, 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 the role of what I call stage relevant talent comes into play, which I think is a solution How does that work? to all of this problem. Um, yeah. Talked about DNA earlier. Um, we call it a startup DNA, but there are people who are better suited naturally through, the, through their attributes and characteristics for uh, the zero to one phase, to use a Peter Thielism, if you will. Mm -hmm. Very good um, at um, embracing ambiguity, creating something from nothing, uh, figuring it out, falling in love with problems instead of solutions, um, creatively working with cross-functionally, as I always call them. They're great at talking to humans and engineers, for example. Um, they, they know how to translate a problem into a solution and bring all the right people together uh, to monetize that in a predictable, repeatable, profitable, scalable way. And once they do, they get bored because they want to go do it again. Mm -hmm. They don't want to manage and grow that. Um, there are people for certain stages of the development of any new idea 
that are better suited than others. And recognizing that that's a thing is, is critically important. So when you dump a new innovation on an existing sales force that is incented by something entirely different, so the incentives are wrong, um, because at the end of the day, we're all still humans and human behavior drives everyone, uh, yeah. their own self-interests and then how they're measured against those interests um, become their interests. Um, and so you distract them from what they're good at. Uh, it hurts existing sales. The new thing never gets off the ground. Um, or you hire people who are used to, again, managing the now and the new and have a support system and a history and referenceable customers and marketing support and sales engineers and um, all the things they're used to when they're carrying a, a book and a quota and you put them in a situation where none of that stuff exists, they're going to fail. And it doesn't make them bad people. It just means they're not suited for this. It's a fit problem. And I think the, the lack of recognition of this notion and this idea that stage relevance is a thing is the biggest, is the biggest um, you know, reason why that, why that happens. Is that something that executives need better training, learning, yes. exposure to? Just general awareness that certain people are made up this way. And the reality is, is that entrepreneurs like myself who have embody this DNA that I'm talking about, we don't want to work in big companies and we don't, right? Uh, they, they're frustrating. They're slow. They don't move. They don't think creatively. They're not outside the box. They're not willing to take risks. All the things that make us who we are, um, uh, uh, are not a match for these organizations. And then if they do hire us, we get frustrated and we flame out very quickly um, because we're not given that safe space um, right. that I'm talking about, right? To move and do things in a certain way. Um, and so it, that, it just never happens. So what ends up happening is, is I build a startup that, that competes with a big company and the company says, well, I'm just going to buy you because, you know, I could never do what you did. And that's what, you know, that's been my career. Uh, and then after the earn out, I'm out of there as quickly as possible because I can't deal with this stuff. And they're perfectly right. nice people. Um, but what it takes to, to create and invent and, and innovate is very different than what it takes to, to op operate and optimize. I have, a, uh, I have a running list of characteristics of entrepreneurship. And uh, you know, the core one is that it's not a job, it's a crucible, right? Like it, if it doesn't fit a little, it doesn't fit at all. And yes. right, most, most people at work and in life, they exist in the smushy middle, right? It's like it, somewhere between like, it's mildly annoying and it's mildly exciting. And for an entrepreneur, the, the spectrum between abject terror and elation has just been like reduced to a switch. <laughs> you're just like back and forth, right? If you're happy, you're the happiest. If you're miserable, you're, it's like the sky is falling. And just that, um, that kind of all or nothing, we got to go, you know, the, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur is existing. Innovation exists at like Maslow's lowest level of the hierarchy. It's like, can this thing be sold? and keep the lights on versus people in organizations who are thinking about the best way to do things. They're actually operating. It's more towards self-actualization. And so, you know, you talk about that, uh, that difference in mindset and, you know, wanting to get out of there as fast as possible. And I can appreciate that because it's, it, it's hard, unless you've lived in both worlds, it's hard to appreciate just how different those, those existences are. Yeah, there's a, yeah, entrepreneurs have to have, I mean, they're, they're almost a cult like in their, in their nature and behavior and their belief, their ab, their just their unwavering conviction and belief, fire and passion that oftentimes they can't explain around a given idea, right? They see a future that doesn't exist and they want to realize that future. Um, and they're willing to get kicked in the nuts and chew broken glass all day, every day to do it. it to me, it's like Andy Crane is tank. You know, you spend eight years right? ripping away at a wall and only to wade through 500 yards of piss and shit. And his reward yeah. is to end up on a beach, sand in a boat with an old guy. Um, well, as an old guy, too. Yeah. But the, okay, I'm, I'm going through this now. It, there's a level of, uh, like, if it doesn't fit a little, it doesn't fit at all. Right. I'm, I'm having conversations with prospective customers for comfort communications. and. 
and it's it's ruthless. It's like, look, either you fit or you don't. You know, these yeah. are my criteria. And um, I had I, I'm having a great conversation with with one woman, and um, you know, and I'm going to ask you about pricing in a second. Pricing came up, and you know, I got to be totally honest with her. I'm like, yeah, this is new. Like, I'm going to tell you, like, you are no longer, this is no longer a negotiation. You are no longer a customer. You are now an advisor to me. I'm going to tell you what I'm hearing from everybody else. And you're going to tell me how close this is to like the reality of your budget. And, and we'll get to value. Like she doesn't, it, but that ability to sit on the same side of the table and work yeah. that problem. If I was in a company and I had to report to a, a, a you know, a, a a territory manager, I don't know how I would explain that conversation to them. <laughs> you did what? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you, you know, there's this old saying, you know, if you live long enough, life uh, will teach you how to live it if, if you let it. And, and, and you're at a stage in your life where your lived experiences have allowed you to understand uh, strategically how to enter these conversations. You've established a set of criteria for yourself around what fit is for you. And now you're going out to the world and saying, this is what I'm looking for. And what you should be doing and what sounds like you're doing, what I tell everybody when they're taking something someplace new is you shouldn't be selling products to customers. You should be recruiting partners who share your vision, understand your current reality because you need to be honest with them about it and are willing to give you the two things uh, you need the most to realize that vision, which is their time and their truth. Um, and things like pricing models and value uh, creation uh, quotients and, 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 and models will, they will emerge once that value has been demonstrated. But what does that value look like? And are you willing to give me as much of your time and truth as I'm willing to give you of my resources to help you realize that vision together? Yeah. And that, it, that takes a special buyer too. You know, that's it does. Um, it's a very limited group. I mean, I, I always use um, Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm as the perfect framework for this, right? You've yeah. got five communities of humans and how and it, he calls it a technology adoption life cycle, but it's really based on a farm study from the 1950s. It's really about how humans respond to risk and change. And the bell curve is what you think it is. 60% of people are in the mainstream. 20% are skeptics and laggards. Forget those 60, forget that 80 for now. What you need yep. are the innovators and early adopters, which represent one in five humans collectively. Individual psychology, not organizational or 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 uh, you know, enterprise, for example, or business psychology, uh, psychology, but an individual psychology, people who are willing to take that risk. Because if you're taking something someplace new, especially if you're a startup, I always tell people that you don't realize it, but this is how you're perceived in the world subconsciously is you are a stranger with a strange offering, going to another stranger and asking them to do strange things with you. And that's why you have to recruit people who have that mindset and that psychology of an innovator or early adopter where they're willing to take that risk and they see the vision and they'll go on that journey with you. So gut check a couple of things for me. Uh, one is I like the, you know, the, the first group is the innovator group. The second group is the early majority. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, you know, the, the idea is when you're, when you've exhausted the 18 or 20% in those two groups, something fundamentally has to change to get to the, the, the big kahuna, uh, part of the bell curve, but the first thing I want to gut check with you is I like the I like the early adopters more than the innovators. I find the innovators are like yes, 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 and mm -hmm. I'm an innovator. You know, the world is a kaleidoscope. You give me a problem, I'll find a way through it, around it, over it. You know, whatever. The early adopt, excuse me, the, the yeah, the early adopters. What I like about them is they're still plugged into the system. The kinds of questions I get from them are like, oh, I like this. I'm going to have to sell this internally. You have to help me with that. And yes. I find there's enough structure with that that I can start to connect, right? Like I'm looking at this, I'm like, ROI. I got like nine different possible ROIs, but I need someone who's going to give me some contrast so I can figure out which of the nine I really need to zero in on so that I know how to build my case studies, deliver my value, you know, build my dashboards, like all the things that will help me sell to that later majority. Am I... Am I making this too oh, hard? Yeah, well, it's, on the right track? Spot on. One way to frame it is, is that innovators are great to help you find problem solution fit. <laughs> and uh, early adopters are great to help you find product market fit. And okay. by that, I mean innovators are great for product and solution feedback early on. 
They're not loyal. Yeah. They'll always move on to the next bright, shiny object. By the way, they don't have any power or influence in the organization because they're viewed as risky because everybody knows how they behave. Um, early adopters, however, have a strategic reason for wanting to work with you. And that's back to my point of they have a vision of the future that they want to see. And if they see that you fit in helping them achieve that future, they do have the power and the budget and the authority usually um, and the influence to be able to make something happen that delivers real results, right? And your job is to find those people. And sometimes you have to use innovators to get to them. And sometimes you're using them to prepare to get to them. Those right. are the people that are going to help you achieve um, a meaningful, repeatable, predictable, scalable use case that will demonstrate to the early majority that uh, you're no longer risky. I love that. And by the way, you don't necessarily even have to get to the early majority to be successful. I mean, there's yeah, so sure. many, there's so many liquidity events and so many success stories and so many exits and so many niche leaders that have just gotten through early adopter, and that's okay. Those markets are big enough too. Well, and you, well, you solve another problem too. You know, you you talked about like all the you, you need truth and and time from people. Mm -hmm. And if you've got the right people, if you've got early adopters as your advocates, as those early customers, as your, your partners, yep. they'll bring the case study. They'll tell you exactly what they need. You don't, you're not going to have to go figure all this stuff out, which I, I love. Uh, all right. I need another gut check. The pricing and ROI. When you are innovating, you don't know. You haven't been to market. You don't have, right? You don't have history. Internally, your company is going to be looking for an internal rate of return so they know what, if anything, to invest in what you're doing. That's going to depend on how you price it. Price it's going to depend on the value you can deliver, and you're probably not sure about that. So you're in this little loop. How do you, how do you break out of it? And I'm going to put a constraint on the question. One thing, and you can call me out on this, but one thing I've learned is you don't innovate product and price at the same time. Pick one. And if you're asking strange people to do strange things, price it exactly like something else they're already familiar with. And if you need to innovate your pricing, you better be just selling the same product that they already know. It's just too much for, for people to hold. So given that you've got a new product, you don't know how people are going to use it. You have a hypothesis, but you're not sure. How do you start to triangulate the right pricing structure and the right way to frame up your ROI? Yeah. So everything you just described, I just call the value creation model. And you lump it all in there, right? Product development, pricing development, iteration. Um, and the most important thing, um, once you've established what the key metrics are for measuring value, and there are leading metrics and lagging metrics. Leading are the things you can immediately demonstrate. You need to focus on those first so that you can continue to show value. And then lagging are your, your hypothesis that over some period of time, it's going to create this other uh, measure of value. Then your customer journey from the sales process through onboarding and usage and success um, has to have these various connections uh, or stages of checkpoints to make sure that you are capturing that value and measuring it. Right. So that has to be the first thing. How do you measure value in, in quantitative and qualitative ways? Right. So I use, the um, you know, uh, an adaptation of Bob Moesta's uh, jobs to be done, uh, which is job, pain, gain, user and metric. OK, um, so by user, what's their job? What's the pain associated with it? What, what are the gains that we think we can create for them? Um, and how do we measure those gains? What do you do if there's a disconnect between uh, the person who's stroking the check and the person who's benefiting? And I, I ask that specifically because a lot of innovation fills gaps. And if you've got a gap, it's probably because there's a disconnect, right? It's somebody's responsibility to take care of X, Y, and Z, but the knowledge that they need is, is sitting in another department. Well, that's just another user, right? So you use the same template because you have an economic buyer, a user buyer, and a technical buyer in any of these complex selling environments. And you have, have mm -hmm. multiple at every level, right? User buyers are people that uses your product, right? Sure. Only tech people and drug dealers call them their customers users. Users. Um, <laughs> um, and then you have your technical buyer, which is the one who's assessing you for risk as to whether or not mm -hmm. you can integrate and plug into their ecosystem without screwing things up. 
and you have they can't say no they can't say yes but they can say no so you have sure. to address them with facts um, and give them everything they need um, the economic buyer is the one that's obviously the slave to the spreadsheet so they are a user in that job pain gain value uh, metric framework right so the economic user has a job they have a pain associated with their job that you might be able to help with so you talk about the gain and then you demonstrate how you measure that gain. And it's going to be different than your users. Some of the things will be the same, but some will be different. So you map those things out and you collaborate with your user buyers and your economic buyers and your technical buyers to learn what those are. You start by constructing hypothesis and you literally do it in a, almost in a workshopping session. But in 15 minutes, I can probably get um, you know, a, a team fat further along without knowing anything about their product or market by just using that framework. And then together you coach and iterate with your user buyers who are your coaches and champions um, with that economic buyer to make sure that those translate correctly. So that's sure. the first step. The second step is how are they used to buying and budgeting? Half the innovations I see aren't, aren't even a budget line item inside of a buyer's organization. And you've never even bothered to ask them if it is because right. it's new. And it doesn't mean they're not going to buy it. 75% of purchases in a year were not budgeted for in the year prior in most enterprises. That's kind of a standard statistic because change wow. happens. New things need to be done, right? This isn't just your standard tech stack of things that you buy every year, whether it's HR tech or it's ERP or it's, it's CRM, right? But you still, you have to know what you're going to replace or which pocket this is going to come out of. Correct. So they have to bring the budget from somewhere. So it either has to be created or it has to be uh, uh, robbed from somewhere else. So you have to understand how they're used to budgeting and buying. So that's the second piece, right? After value as part of the value creation model, right? Mm -hmm. What's your value? How do you measure it in quantitative and qualitative ways that can be tracked and that both parties agree on? That's step one, right? Use the job paying game framework uh, to understand uh, how to do that, right? Step two is how do they budget and buy, right? And understand that landscape and where you fit in. Um, and then step three is what are other people with similar messages and stories in the market that may already be established that are doing something similar to you? Um, what are they selling for and how are they selling and what are they telling your customers from the outside? So that sort of creates the framing around the box in which you can play. Okay. Yep. And then the big caveat to all of that is, is you, is number one, pricing is the most is the hardest and most dynamic thing, and it constantly changes and evolves, and it always will, right? Um, the other the other caveat to that is uh, you don't have to charge right out of the gate to learn where value is created, um, and it's not the end of the world if you don't. Um, you have to validate uh, your idea in the market through a proof of concept or some sort of relationship, because your goal is mm -hmm. to get to that cohort, statistically significant cohort of happy early customers that will tell the world they're better off with you than without you and why. Um, and that's what's going to propel you forward from there. That is a great structure. Thank you. Only 30 that years. Is, of out. But I, I don't often take notes while I'm doing these things. Uh, right. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> but it's the, it's the most common question I get from my startup entrepreneurs in my portfolio or any of the incubators sure. accelerating my help uh, from the corporates. Everybody's obsessed with the pricing thing. Well, you know what? When I um, when I first entered the corporate world and I'm going getting my MBA at nights and I hear pricing is a board level decision. I'm like, what the hell is wrong with people? How hard is it? It's 495, it's 1995. Come on. And yeah. then you get a little scar tissue and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> this is <laughs> look at the end of the day, you just have to, with those early adopters and innovators, mutually agree on how to measure uh, what what creates value and how you measure that value. Yeah. And then based on that, it's a math problem. And then well, of course it, you incorporate how they buy and budget and uh, what else they're used to buying and budgeting for in the same area. I'm going to loop this around and include something else you talked about. It's also a mindset problem because very often there is a, a long get, uh, gap between your leading and your lagging indicators. And yes. right. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, so if you don't have, um, if, I think a lot of folks in corporate don't realize how uh, addicted to their existing baseline they are. 
they're just so accustomed to seeing, oh, we're two percent high, we're five percent below, we're on, on everything, right? The the monthly dashboards, the weekly dashboards, that that thinking is so embedded that when handed a zero to one opportunity, there's really a lack of appreciation for how long it takes to get it right. Well, that's because none of them, very few of them, if any, have ever been through it. And until you you, experience it, it, it's really difficult to explain to people the emotional roller coaster that you're on. And there's no such thing as just this up and to the right. It's this. And it's it's, it's, it's minute by minute, hour by hour. That's why I'm, that's I, why I've, I've, uh, I've become a, a massive consumer of stoicism. That's <laughs> why just manage my emotional level on a daily basis. I was, what I was just going to say was one of my other truisms about entrepreneurs is your job is just to hold the stress. That's a good point. You should, you should you know, ask spouses about that, in fact. I mean, somebody should write a book about the spouses of entrepreneurs and the partners of entrepreneurs and what they have. Oh, my God. Them. What, what I, I am so appreciative they're the strong, for. They're the strong ones. Please. Right? Oh, my gosh. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's so true. The stories, the stories uh, they could tell, right? Lisa, if you're watching this, I appreciate you. Yes, um, Tanya, same thing. Uh, but you, it's a duck on water scenario, right? You do have to be the duck on water. Your, your, your emotions are your feet paddling furiously underneath. Uh, no one can see you. But you have to do that, right? You, somebody has to be the, the, uh, the adult in the room. Uh, so so the speaking of the adult in the room, here, this, is the, this is like the last. We've actually made it through all the questions I have for you, which is amazing. I never get through all my questions. Um, most of them I didn't even have to ask. You're, it's just, it's great. Evaluating an idea, there are models for that, right? You can figure out your market size and there's models. There's actually models for people too. I mean, I used to do executive assessment work. Uh, I think it's, it's a glitch in the human condition that we, do. we don't want to, we all want to believe we're unique until it's a generational or an astro- astrological thing, then we'll get in the box with like, oh my God, Leo. Right? People like, love oh, yes. Easy. Right? Yeah. We just, we, we only, we like them in a particular context. When it comes to innovation, you talked about mindset, uh, we write character. Uh, it's, it's, what I'm interested in knowing is are there specific things that you've learned to look for either in entrepreneurs when making an investment or in, oh, look at that, um, in um, uh, corporate executives that help you say, yeah, right, this person's got the skills that'll tip the odds in favor of, of something new here. Yeah, I think I, and I don't even know if this is my pin tweet right now, but I, it was for a while. Um, <clears throat> and, and I may be screwing it up if I could go to my Twitter to refresh me, but I'm looking for people who share my values, uh, understand my vision, my current reality, and are willing to run through a wall ethically to help me achieve that vision. Um, So that's sort of the high level. Um, Then there's the, I want want to see your experiences. Um, So in my world, I hire (laughs) artists, I hire hire artists um, and athletes. Um, why do I do that? Um, and entrepreneurs, I can, I can guess. Can I guess? Yeah. Uh, athletes and artists. I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear those two groups put together is the, uh, the Teddy Roosevelt quote about being the man on, in the arena instead of, uh, in the stands. These are people who put themselves out there in a public way. They're not just set up to fail if people don't like what they do. They're set up to get personally crushed <laughs> if what they do, and they're going to get back up and do it again. Is that eventually? Well, I think maybe it was uh, that reminds me, uh, maybe it was Churchill that said it. Entrepreneurship is just uh, going from one failure to the next with no loss of enthusiasm. Right? Yeah. Churchill, um, Edison, pick your. Over. Yeah, whoever. Yeah, yeah. Right. Whoever said it. But, um, but I absolutely agree with that um, because um, use the office axiom you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. But um, the, but so I look for people that have ex- experience in in zero to one, um, preferably failures, not just wins. Um, sometimes there's nothing worse than a first time successful entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> get into that later. But um, uh, you're not as good as you think you are. Right, and then and 
and, and I particularly love collegiate athletes from small liberal arts colleges that lost more than they won. Um, really? I mean, you have Which to have sport? a passion for it. In team you... sports. Preferably team sports. Look, and I, I've done it all. I, I, you know, I, I played college golf, which is a different thing. It's an yeah. individual sport. You're playing on a team, but it's really you and the golf ball and the golf course, and, and you've got to manage your emotions. You've got to deal with all those things. And you've got to love the truth because golf ball never lies to you. Um, but there's, there's something about the way these people are built, right, and they're made up that they can handle everything that's coming their way, and they recognize that they don't know what they don't know. They're, they're learn-it-alls, not know-it-alls. They can embrace ambiguity. They can communicate well with anybody. They can. They have strong emotional intelligence. Um, they can use and develop mental models to close the gaps quickly. Um, they love learning in an immersive fashion, and they're not afraid of of, of the outcome of the results. And they always have. They always come from a place of my success comes from yours. Um, and I'll be successful yeah. if you're successful, and I'm here to help. And technology you- is the promise of helping the most people. Have you found a way to harness rehearsals or practices? I find one of the beautiful things about sports metaphors is that they're clean. I'm practicing, I'm playing. There's a game clock. Business, there's no game clock. There's no set time for practice. Like it's always game time. Um, have you found a way to integrate some of that uh, playtime into your innovation process so that people can say, look, for the next little bit, I'm going to be an artist and I'm just going to, I'm going to put paint on a canvas and it may not work, but I got to do a thing here before I, I start acting with a, with a particular outcome in mind. Yeah. So I think it, I think it starts with um, setting the, 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 the boundaries that there are no boundaries. <laughs> um, so you give people the latitude and freedom to do things the way they think they need to be done in order to get them done and done the way they, they, they should be done, which means, you know, there's a lot of latitude, right? Um, and there's not a whole lot of control um, and micromanagement over the process. There's a framework under which they operate, which means that what they're doing today is going to be different. It could be different based on what they learn. Um, there's a whole series of things that need to get done to find product market fit. Do they happen in order? Absolutely not. Um, but we know what the activities and the deliverables are. And we know based on that, some will get a lot more weight and effort than others, and some won't. Um, there's a lot of collaboration, right? There's a lot of um, workshopping. Um, there's a lot of, of doing things not in a conference room, inside of an old gray building um, to spur creativity. But you give them that latitude so that they have the freedom um, to fuck up as many times as they need to fuck up until they find out what works. Uh, And then give them the psychological safety uh, to know that that's okay and make sure that they feel heard um, and supported. And those are the kinds of people, and and you've got to do that with a, with, 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 and I mean this, like a, like an absolute level of trust. Um, Right. It's it, the the Navy SEALs use that matrix of trust and performance. And my dad was a SEAL. My uncle was a SEAL. And I learned this when I was very young. Um, Trust trumps performance 100% of the time. You know, if I can't trust you and I don't feel trusted, we're not going to perform optimally. So you've got to provide that. Um, and, you know, they'll test you, right? Your people will test you the first few times things go, go rough. How do you react if they screwed something up or if something got screwed up that they're a victim of that circumstance? Um, that's really important um, that they know that you've got their back. Uh, you know, we're approaching the top of the hour. And you have shared a lot of stuff. I want to to summarize a couple of the key things that I'm hearing as you talk about innovation. And, and, you know, I know we started, we were talking uh, about some of the AI impacts that are coming. And I appreciate you indulging me in in kind of peeling back to what it takes to bring those things to market. Because what I'm curious about is, you know, if I'm listening to this and I'm trying to make the shift to AI, I could have all the big ideas in the world. If I can't get there, I'm, I'm stuck. And, and here's what I'm hearing. First of all, you have a framework for this. You've, you know, like hitting a baseball or a golf ball, you've taken the process and you've broken it down into component parts. And each part is manageable in turn, which is already just a phenomenal insight. And then as I think about what those component parts are, 
when you talked about people, you talked about mindset, skill set, experience, and right. And there's there's an extrapolation there from an organizational culture perspective, right? And and more often than not, it's going to fail. So you want to take the innovative innovating group and you want to isolate them, ideally in their own organization, so that they're not uh, they're not beholden to people who don't get that zero to one mindset, who don't have that experience. Uh, there's a there's a sense of cycles to a lot of the things that you say, which includes you know, a run up, a management, and then an exit. And you've, we haven't really talked about it explicitly, but it's come up repeatedly as a theme. You talk about people leaving the growth curve before you ever get to the you know, late majority. And you talked about uh, the, um, the uh, diminishing returns of innovation after a period of time. So this idea of like, don't get too attached. All this stuff's happening on a cycle. Uh, in terms of getting started, partnering with your customers, making sure that you are working with people who match your values, who will give you their time and their truth, and bringing a framework to, the, to understanding the value chain that helps you isolate the value you're going to provide to each member of, the, right? I mean, sales does this, but doing it at a deeper, more honest level, painfully honest level for your economic buyer, for your user, for, right? Understanding how do you guys relate? Like, who makes the budget? How does it, you're going to have some really, really, uh, you're going to roll up your sleeves. You're going to have some really just naked conversations with these folks. Uh, and then, you know, processes, you know, I haven't asked about them because you can read about the last stuff in, in a book, but having processes for evaluating what potential opportunities are there and what's working and what's not and having you hit your metrics and, you know, all the, all the stuff that I think people would probably expect coming into a conversation like that. Like you already know that stuff. So I kind of skipped it, but these are the things that I'm hearing as an undercurrent, you know, the specifics around people and the specifics around the, the breaking down the, the way in which to break down the value chain, uh, making sure that you have partnerships that trust is that that comes first, that this isn't a performance thing today. It's a character and trust and team thing. Uh, that it's just been immensely helpful hearing you talk through this and seeing, oh, this doesn't have to be such a random walk. There is a way to think about this in a more structured way to tip the odds uh, in your favor for success. Yeah, I, I, I've become a big believer in mental models and frameworks for any and all of this journey, but you've got to kind of start with the overall cycle and think about things at that level. Um, where to start? I think there's there, there's there's two way there's two places you can start. You can start with what are we really good at? What are our core assets and capabilities? You know what's our long term strategy? Uh, and then how do we align the new things we're going to do with that? Okay, our AI, for example, shameless plug, is fantastic at answering those questions in hours, or at least starting the conversation in a framed, uh, a well framed way. The other is to work from the customer back. What are your, what's your Sunday afternoon problem? That's what I call it, right? The biggest problems yep. that you can solve are the Sunday afternoons, meaning the executive thinks about it on Sunday afternoon at three o'clock um, when they go to, before they go to work on Monday and it bugs them because it's just recurring. What is that Sunday afternoon problem? And what's the wedge use case that you can develop together to solve for that problem? Um, <clears throat> and then they, the, the more advanced way is to merge those two. Right. And you create a, you know, your concentric circles with that point in the middle, which says, here's the here's a Sunday afternoon problem that I have the core assets and capabilities that I can solve really well in a market that's big enough for us to care about. And then let's go test that. I love that. All right. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, somebody needs you plus wants to learn more about innovation. Yeah. Well, well your email's easy. Sean, S-E-A-N at the letter U dot P-L-U-S. So Sean at U dot plus. You can get me on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, on the Twitter, you know, um, I'm available. I'm, I'm easy to find. Uh, so reach out, reference the, the, the chat and uh, be happy to, to help you. Yeah, you're brilliant too. You you did not disappoint. Thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, I learned a ton and Thanks, I appreciate Jason. that. I've always enjoyed our conversations over the years and I'm glad you're doing this now because I think people need need this. And I think this is great. Thanks. Hang on for one second. I'm going to end the stream. Thanks, everybody. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks.